free speech goes on. So it turns out that your administrators are a bunch of hacks. <laughs> Pathetic crybaby wusses who only care about the melting snowflakes who didn't even have balls to show up, by the way. You got 35 people, 35 security people for little old me. No, not even any protesters, just for me because of my jujitsu skills and my massive 5'9", 165 Jewish frame. Okay, so I want to start. I come bearing gifts, particularly for the social justice warriors. So I keep hearing that you fellas, that you party, party people, that you want to... Uh, you're wearing around these, these safety pins. So I brought a whole pack of safety pins just for you. And then to accompany those, I brought the diapers you ought to be wearing. So you can pin that up. You self-indulgent, pathetic children who can't handle anybody who has an opposing point of view. Yeah, you're real strong. You're real tough. So strong and so tough, you have to stand behind the security and the police officers that you're bashing every single day. I promise you, in the privacy of their own homes, every member of that security team and every member of the police force is in agreement with me, not the people who they're protecting from my supposed free speech threat. Okay, now, quick note about all the protests that are taking place across the country, just as a preliminary. A lot of protests taking place about Donald Trump. These people are idiots, okay? I didn't vote for Trump for reasons both moral and political, but you can keep whining about reality like privileged snowflakes, but you're going to melt in the sun of the real world. Donald Trump does not give two shits about what you think. <laughs> he is going to bathe in your salty tears. Okay, now, on to more important matters. Today we're going to take apart three terms. We're going to do it really quickly because now we've been time compressed and I want to make sure that Christina was kind enough to cede the podium to me in this ridiculous situation. I want to make sure that Christina has the capacity and the time to speak. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about social justice, white privilege, and safe spaces. Okay, so first of all, social justice. So back in May, Milo spoke at this university, and the SJWs shut down his event by storming the stage and screaming obscenities and threatening violence. And the Reverend Dennis Holtschneider sent a letter to the students the following day that said universities welcome speakers and give their ideas a respectful hearing, and then respond with additional speech countering the ideas. This, of course, opened the floodgates. One prominent law professor wrote that the president had betrayed marginalized students, and within minutes, the guy was basically fired for not having issued an apology abject enough for having someone who disagreed. As you all know, I'm not a Milo fan, but the fact is, free speech is free speech, and this is ridiculous. Tonight, as we just saw, the administration announced that they would be willing to arrest me if I took two steps forward, not even to speak. If I was even in the audience for Christina's speech, they would arrest me. This is not America. This is Soviet-style bullshit. You don't get to do this in America. Now, this isn't justice, of course, because justice means that your individual actions have individual consequences. This is social justice. Social justice, by the way, is an oxymoron, and it is for morons. Social justice is the idea... Social justice is the idea that if you are guilty, you might still be treated as in innocent because of your race. That if, you are, that if you do something wrong in life, we can excuse that depending on your color or your sex or your sexual orientation. Social justice says that your group, group identity relieves you of individual responsibility. And hardcore leftists like to call themselves social justice warriors because they think that individual justice, that you have, being treated decently as an individual, treating others decently as an individual, that is racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic. They think that we should be held responsible not for our actions but for the group to which we belong. Now, in normal parlance, we call this racist. In normal parlance, we call this sexist, treating people not based on who they are as individuals and what they do, but based on their identity. Race doesn't mean anything. Sex doesn't mean anything when it comes to whether you're a good person or a bad person. But social justice warriors, they say that that standard is just too terrible. It's just too insulting. Social groups must be treated as superior to individuals. Okay, now, the problem with this, of course, is that it's racist. But the question is why the left believes in this sort of stuff. Why does the left believe in what is something that is inherently unfair, something that is inherently racist and sexist and bigoted. Why? And the answer is because the left believes that every person in the world should finish up in the same place. They believe in equal outcomes. They believe that no matter how you're treated, no matter what you're upbringing, no matter how you act, everybody should end up in the same place. So if you have two people in a room, one rich, one poor, the rich person must have stolen from the poor person because equality of outcome has not been achieved. And the same thing holds true for groups. If you have a group of black people and a group of white people, then equality has not been achieved unless the black people and the white people are of equal status economically, of equal status in society. Equality of outcome is the only thing that matters. And the problem is that individual justice means that some people are not going to finish 
in the same place as others. Some people are going to take actions that are not beneficial. Some people are going to do stupid things. Some people are going to do smart things. So how does the left solve that conundrum of individual justice? How do they solve the basic truth? How do they make way for the basic truth that some people do smart things and some people do stupid things, and that's what really causes inequality in a free country? They say the real reason, the real reason that some people underachieve is, of course, because of white privilege. Right? Social justice warriors think the only thing that matters in the world is white privilege. It's a bunch of white evil people, and those white evil people are going to take advantage of you. The system was built by all these white evil people for the benefit of their own kind. That's the basic idea here. White privilege is inherent in everything. We have to tear down white privilege. And this is a very seductive idea, of course. The campus left gives people a feeling of virtue, it makes them feel virtuous by counting them members of victimized identity groups. So if you don't do well in life, then it's not because you made bad choices. It's not because even of your individual circumstance, it's because America as a country has put you down because you are not one of these privileged white males. Which means the bad guys in this whole narrative are, of course, the privileged white males, right? The white, heterosexual, cisgender males. We are the bad guys. We are the villains here. Now, the good news for the white, heterosexual, cisgender males is there is an easy way to get out of this. And that is to just repent. Just admit that everything you did in your life, everything the founders did, everything that all the white people did ever, all of that was designed so that you could benefit now. And all of your successes and your parents' successes, those weren't due to great decisions. And people's non-success isn't based on bad decisions. All of this is just based on you and you and you, if you just repent and admit that you've never done anything good in your life and that the system is built for your benefit, then they say you're an okay person, which is just one. Okay, now, before we go further, I do want to note something, right? It is true, of course, that black people and other minorities, but particularly black people, have suffered historic discrimination in the United States. That's inarguably true. It's even true that some people are likely suffering the effects of historic discrimination, historic discrimination, the after effect under Jim Crow. But that doesn't mean Black people right now are suffering institutional discrimination. It doesn't mean that. Okay, it turns out that in the world, you're born into circumstances beyond your control. Some of us are born rich. Some of us are born poor. Some people are, some of us are born smart. Some of us are born to Paul administrators, right? <laughs> we cannot fix where you start in life, and we can't fix where you finish in life. That is all beyond our control. The only thing we can control is making sure that your rights are not violated. And it turns out that America is a free and open country where white privilege is not what makes people successful or not successful. Decision privilege is what makes people successful or not successful. What you do as an individual is going to define whether you have a good life or not in the United States of America. What you decide to do is going to decide whether your kids succeed or fail in America. Not some white guy out in the sticks somewhere who's dreaming about how he's going to ruin your life. It turns out in America, most people don't give a crap that much. Okay, nobody is saying where that, that black guy in the inner city. I'm sitting around my dinner table at night thinking, how do I keep that black guy in the inner city down? Nobody is doing that. The number of people who are doing that is minuscule or zero. The actual privilege that exists in any free country is the privilege of decision. So... If you want to know why there is disproportionate poverty in the black community, the most obvious reason there is disproportionate poverty in the black community is because there is disproportionate single motherhood in the black community. And that has nothing to do with race. It has to do with bad decisions. The poverty rate among white single parent families, white single mother families is 22%. The poverty rate among black two parent families is 7%. What happened to the white privilege? Did it just disappear? Did the white people decide that everything was okay now and so black two parent families were all right? Or does it turn out that if you have one parent in the home, it makes it a lot harder to thrive in the workplace. It makes it a lot harder to thrive in raising your child. Right, here's another privilege, the not committing crimes privilege. Everybody keeps talking about white privilege is the reason why there are so many black people in jail. No, black people are committing a disproportionate share of crimes. That's the reason there are a lot of black people in jail. If you don't want to go to prison, as I just found out, all you have to do is not violate the law. Right? If you, if you, don't, want to go to jail, if you don't want to go to jail for murder, the easiest way to do that is to not murder people. And the statistics bear this out. As early as 1994, the DOJ surveyed felony cases across the country's 75 largest urban areas found lower felony prosecution rates for blacks than for whites. In 2015, the DOJ analyzed the Philly Police Department. They found white officers were less likely, less likely to shoot black suspects than black or Hispanic officers. There's a survey in July 2016, a Harvard professor named Roland Fryer, front page of the New York Times. He surveyed 1,000 police shootings. He found black suspects are shot less often than white suspects in comparable situations. Fryer, by the way, is black. How about stop and frisk? That's racist, right? That's obviously white privilege, except for the fact that stop and frisk statistically under-targeted minorities in New York City. Between, June and, between January and June 2008, 
Literally 98% of all gun assailants in New York City were black or Hispanic. The number of people pulled over for stop and frisk in that same period were black or Hispanic was 85%. How about pulling people over for speeding, right? This is white privilege, speeding while black, right? The driving while black. Well, back in the early 90s, the New Jersey State Police were targeted. They were supposed to be responsible for this sort of racial profiling. It turned out the New Jersey State Police were pulling over black people 23% of the time for speeding. Only one problem, 25% of the speeders in the state of New Jersey were actually black. About sentencing disparities, right? You keep hearing President Obama talk about the criminal justice system is so racist, and look at the sentencing disparities between cocaine and, and various other drugs, between crack and powder, which typically is the one they use. Well, the fact is, the, the reason that crack cocaine is penalized more than, than powder cocaine is because black legislators in the inner cities were sick of watching crack ravage their cities. It's more addictive, it's easier to distribute, and actually the penalty for crack cocaine and, and, uh, and crystal meth, which is largely a white crime, is exactly the same in federal law. But all of this is white privilege, right? All of the inequality that springs from bad behavior, that is white privilege, all of it. When Baltimore riots, and it's largely black, right? It's a majority black town with majority black police force and a black police chief and a black attorney general and a black president and a largely, and, and nine out of 15 of the members of the city council are black and all 15 are Democrats. When that city riots because a black guy is killed, by, is killed in the custody of black police officers, that's white privilege. Everything is white privilege. Everything is white privilege. And if we're going to talk about privilege, really, we ought to be talking about the really nefarious people, the really nefarious people who are, who are privileged in the United States. I'm talking, of course, about the nefarious Asians, right? Because the, because the nefarious Asians are the ones who actually make more money on average than white folks. They get into better colleges on average than white folks. And that makes sense because, after all, the system was rigged for the benefit of Asian people, right? But this is why, you know, the, the Asian founders created an Asian constitution on behalf of Asian people, which is why the constitution is written in Korean. <laughs> White privilege is just a way to tell you to shut up. It's a way to say that your perspective doesn't matter because of the color of your skin. It is baseline racism. It is baseline racism. Okay, so the left can't actually make the argument that the system is responsible for all of the inequality in society. So next, they come up with a different argument. And that argument is that we all have to be equal in terms of feelings. All of our feelings have to be equal. And the way to do that is to have safe spaces. Do you all feel equal? Do you feel equal now that you've all been booted from that hall because you don't have a perspective that matches that of the administrators and the idiot protesters who think it's okay to post Black Lives Matter sign, that it's evil and terrible to post Unborn Lives Matter sign? Do you feel equal? Do you feel better? No, I didn't think so. But see, it only applies to one side. Everybody has to feel equal, and the left gets to decide whose feelings actually matter. And so they have trigger warnings, right? We have to have trigger warnings to ensure that everybody is able to survive the, the catastrophic horror of hearing Christina Hoff Summers talk. Right? They, their life might be over. They might be shaking for days. It's just like nom, right? <laughs> we have to warn people about microaggressions. Everybody has to be very careful of microaggressions because you wouldn't want to be microaggressed. And it's not even that I intend to offend you, it's that if you are offended subjectively, then I have microaggressed you. And that, by the way, allows you to do things like call out the cops, right? If I microaggress you, then you are allowed to do violent things in response. The very language of microaggressions suggested I have done something aggressive to you, and now you can do something aggressive to me, right? You can threaten to arrest me if I set foot on your campus. And my favorite story about this, and I'll tell it quickly for, pu for purposes of time, but th this has bled up all the way into the upper echelons of the left. Uh, one example, uh, how many of you ever watched a CNN headline news? Show of hands. Okay, that is the entire viewership of CNN headline news. They just raised their hands. No one has ever seen CNN headline news. So uh, right about the time that Caitlyn Jenner uh, was becoming, of course, our great national saint, uh, ESPN, ESPN decided that uh, it was important to honor Caitlyn Jenner with the Hero of the Year award. And so CNN headline news decided, okay, we want to have, sh have somebody on to discuss this who's from the right. So they actually looked up conservative in the white pages. I'm the only one in the 30-mile radius of CNN studios in LA. And, uh, and, so, I, and so they called me. Uh, and my perspective on transgenderism, by the way, is that transgenderism is a, is a tragic and horrible mental disorder, and that treating it as anything less than that, treating it as though men can magically become women and women can magically become men, that's mythical crap that is designed to make a small segment of people feel better, but doesn't actually help the people who are suffering, and certainly does nothing for the, for the sanity of a society at large that's being told to change their definitions of basic biology based on subjective feeling. Right? That's my perspective on transgenderism. Anyway, they call me in to discuss this, and uh, I get in there, and the producer walks up to me, and he says, you know, Mr. Shapiro, we don't have any ratings on this now. And I said, yes, I'm well aware. And he said, <laughs> and he said, 
Well, you know, tonight we want to do something a little bit different. And uh, by the way, I was a producer with Jerry Springer. Uh, and at that point, I should have said, okay, I, I need to leave. But being the intrepid sort, I said, no, I'm, we'll, do, we'll go ahead anyway. They put me on the stage. And on the stage, it's me and, uh, and one, two, three other people next to me. And then three, three, I think it was three other people on the stage, including Dr. Drew. All of them have left. So it was me against six leftists, which made it almost fair for them. So, they, so, we, start, so we start the debate on Caitlyn Jenner. And, uh, and the, the only debate that's happening is, is Caitlyn Jenner a hero or the greatest hero? It, should Caitlyn Jenner be given an, a spot in Arlington National Cemetery or actually canonized? Should Caitlyn Jenner be granted the papal supremacy or should, or should Caitlyn Jenner actually be given a chariot of fire to ascend to heaven? Right? These, were, these were the only questions that were being So finally they come to me and they say, what do you think? And I express to you what I think. I said, I, I don't see what's heroic about this. This is tragic to me. It's somebody expressing his mental illness on a public stage and the entire country acting as though this is something wonderful. And it isn't. And uh, I neglected to mention, the person sitting next to me is a transgender person, uh, and his, uh, his name was Zoe Turb, so this is formerly Bob Turb. And, uh, and Zoe turns to me, uh, and Zoe says, you don't know anything about biology, little boy, in a voice at least an octave lower than mine. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I know enough about Caitlyn Jenner's biology to know that every single cell of Caitlyn Jenner's body has a Y chromosome in it, except, ironically, for the exception of some of his sperm cells. And... Again, Zoe keeps pushing. No, you don't know anything about biology. You don't know anything about genetics, little boy. You don't know anything about genetics. And finally, after you know, a minute and a half of this, I turn and I say, what are your genetics, sir? And it was the sir that set him off. Um, on, national TV, on national TV, he reaches over and grabs me by the back of the neck. Really, this is on national TV, live. Uh, he grabs me by the back of the neck and he says, if you don't cut that out, I'll send you home in an ambulance. And honest to God, the first thought that went through my mind was, you don't even go in home in ambulance. Is it, is it? I mean, it's not what ambulances are for. Uh, and the, but what, what, I actually, what I actually said was, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political conversation. But everybody else on the panel, and this is the part that matters, everybody else on the panel didn't turn on Zoe for grabbing me by the back of the neck and threatening me on national TV, which is battery and assault, actually, by the technical legal definition. That is, uh, instead, they said, how dare you say anything offensive? How could you have offended Zoe that way? That is just terrible. That is just terrible. And that's the mentality of the left. When they say they want equality of feelings, equality of feelings can only be enforced at the point of gun or through the use of force. And by the way, the threats of force didn't stop there. As Zoe was hulking off the set, Zoe turns to me and says, I'll see you in the parking lot. It was more like, I'll see you in the parking lot. And I, and, and I said, no, you won't. And, uh, and, secu and security actually ushered me out. I have a lot of experience with security in the last couple of years. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then later the next day, Zoe, said, Zoe threatened me on, on Twitter to curb stomp me, to curb stomp me on Twitter, all of which personally I thought was deeply unladylike behavior. <laughs> so you know, once you've gotten rid of the trigger warnings and the microaggressions, then finally you have your pathetic safe spaces for all of you snowflakes who can't deal with the real world and are convinced that the real world is going to conform to your standards of what it ought to be, that the real world is constructed just for you. Let me tell you a secret. The real, in the real world, no one pays you to believe in the power of your dreams. In the real world, nobody cares about your internal feelings. In the real world, all people care about is whether you do good things or bad things. But the safe spaces you construct suggest that you are allowed to ban people who think differently than you in order to achieve a better outcome for yourself. It is the essence of fascism. And all this, of course, makes kids nuts. It makes kids nuts. It makes administrators nuts, clearly. Right? You, you're, you're being made insane. If you're taught that you're a victim, that you're always a victim, or alternatively, that you're a victimizer, if you're taught that over and over and over again until it never stops, eventually you're going to go out and realize that you get benefit for being a victim. The more you claim victimhood, the better off you are. And this is what the left has done. They've created an entire society of the victim mentality where they say your own work, your own labor, the things you do, they make no difference in life. All that matters is you claim you're a victim, and we give you extra credit. You get special points in heaven and on earth for being a victim. And if you act aggressively because you're a victim, we'll excuse that too. This is pretty dangerous stuff. There's a reason that a Pew poll in 2015 found that 40% of millennials, you know, people our age, I'm still part of your generation, believe the government should be able to prevent people from making statements that are offensive to minority groups. That's the repeal of the First Amendment. And we're watching it happen in real time. So here's the bottom line. Social justice, white privilege, safe spaces, these concepts are designed to destroy American ideology. 
They're designed to destroy American philosophy. America is based on the, on the foundational principle that you and you alone are responsible for your actions and that you get to say whatever you want so long as you're not physically harming anyone else. That is what America is based on, and the left is ripping away at those foundational principles. The left is saying, you're not responsible for your actions. Everybody else is. And they're saying, you don't get to say what you want if it offends somebody else of the left. This is how a democracy, this is how a republic slides slowly into fascism with a smiley face. Right? It doesn't come with the jackboots. It comes first with the flowers and the smiley face and the safety pins. Right? That's, how, that's where they come from. And the people marching in the streets about the results of a, of a just-decided election, how about this? How about go out and vote? That might have helped. If you didn't like the outcome, you could have gone out and vote. There's just a, a story that these riots that are happening in Portland, literally half of the people rioting did not vote in this election. Okay, these are people who are not interested in upholding the American system. They're not interested in the Constitution. They're not interested in the Declaration. They're not interested in what America is and historically has been. But you are. All of you are. Whether you're left or right in this room, you are. Because you actually want to hear different ideas. You actually care about hearing different ideas. You actually care about a free country where people can disagree with you without being threatened with arrest, where people can actually say things that you don't like without them being threatened with physical harm. We all have to stand together now because that group is getting smaller and smaller. If we stand together, we cannot be defeated because in the end, freedom will triumph over tyranny. But we have to understand the threat that is, and the threat is tyranny. And if that threat didn't materialize right before your eyes tonight, I don't know what would. We have to fight it every step of the way. We have to fight the politically correct, against the politically correct tyrants who would destroy the foundations of the republic. And I think all of us are part of a battle now. All of us are part of that army. All of us are part of that group. You've been deputized. You're all part of it. You all have cell phones. You're all capable of this. Be part of the fight. Be part of the army. Thanks so much for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs>